Welcome everyone to the Warden Post podcast, the playground of dangerous ideas. I'm joined today by William T. Cavanaugh. Bill, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, my pleasure, Richard. So for those who don't know, William T. Cavanaugh is the author of many such fine books as Migrations of the Holy, fantastic book. And as you can see by all the colored tabs I've got here, rather embarrassingly, but I promise there's a method in my madness there, being consumed, which, um, well, yeah, the, the book certainly consumed me. Um, utterly fascinating. I've been looking forward to speaking to Bill for a very long time. Uh, so glad that you joined us, Bill. Um, and I want to start with a slightly difficult question. Um, you are probably best known for your ideas about um, secular modernity, and correct me if I'm wrong here, by the way, secular modernity being um, not so much an absence of religion in Western society, but in fact, um, it, it, it is a, a religion in itself, e even liberalism, or um, perhaps more extreme modern political views such as you know communism. Uh, you've argued um, that, well, these are actually very religious things, um, not just uh, political, sort of separated apart from religious human activities, but um, also in themselves fundamentally very religious activities. Um, yes, when I speak to academics and I say, have you heard of William T. Kavanagh? And they say, ah, yeah, 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 he's the, the wars of religion guy, right? The guy who says that, uh, um, you know, the, the wars of religion ripping Europe apart. Actually, these were very secular, very politically driven uh, movements, no less religious though. Um, so finally, to get to my question here, could you please, could you please uh, give the audience your elevator pitch of um, why secular modernity is religious? Okay, so um, two steps in the argument, I think. So the first uh, step is to notice and I'm not by any means alone in this, to notice how much things that we call secular uh, resemble and function like things that we call religion. And this, there's a, a, you know, an enormous literature on Marxism as a religion, for example, the famous volume by ex-Marxists, which came out in the 50s, maybe called The God That Failed, um, you know, all of them talking about how, um, uh, there's an eschatology, there's a liturgy, there's, um, you know, a theology, there's an anthropology, all of this in Marxism. And that, you know, is a theme that's, that's often uh, noticed and acknowledged uh, by many. Um, it becomes a little bit more difficult to see it in ourselves. Um, so people who recognize the religious nature of Marxism are a little bit more reluctant to recognize the religious nature of the so-called secular things that we in the West do. But there's another huge literature on nationalism as religion, for example. Um, all of these liturgical forms of how to, how to treat the flag with reverence um, and all of the, the sacramentals and the memorials and the sacrifices, of course, uh, in war and the devotion and all of it, you know, it, um, it's been argued very cogently, I think, that in a lot of ways, the nation state replaces the church as the locus of the holy. That's, so the, the uh, migration of the holy is a um, title that I actually borrowed from uh, historian John Bossy, who kind of sees this migration of, um, of what is considered sacred uh, from the church to the, um, to the nation state and elsewhere. Uh, in modernity, and this I think was was Emil Durkheim's kind of central uh, insight as well, is that really um, it's just what we call religion is a group of people worshiping themselves, uh, other, you know, um, and so, um, and you can see it in uh, capitalism as well, another whole literature on capitalism and consumerism as a kind of religion, you know, this idea of the invisible hand 
of the market as if God is guiding these forces and we can only obey, you know, you can't, uh, you can't go against the, the market um, and all of the ways that we fetishize um, and sacramentalize material goods, um, the way that, you know, Philip Goodchild ar argues that uh, money has replaced God, um, money occupies the position that God occupied in the medieval uh, period as the kind of abstract um, transcendent guarantor of value and so on. Um, so all of these things, um, uh, you know, Eugene McCarraher's book, The Enchantments of Mammon uh, is 800 pages of um, showing how uh, corporate culture has kind of taken on the trappings of religion. You know, I, I just finished a book called The Culting of Brands where an advertising agent basically looks at how cults work, um, cults in, in a non-pejorative term, and says, this is the way that brands uh, work as well. This is how you, you know, you look at um, what happens with the Mormons and you can um, see what happens with Apple, uh, for example. And, and he's, again, kind of using the term cult in a non-pejorative sort of way. Um, so all of these ways of noticing that um, what we call the secular oftentimes uh, functions like what we call the religious, but the second step in the argument, so a lot of people are willing to go uh, that far, but then the second step of the argument is to look at um, what exactly is this distinction between the religious and the secular? Is this, if they resemble each other so much, then what exactly is the distinction? And you notice that um, nobody agrees on a definition of religion. There's a hundred different definitions of religion. And so uh, another group of scholars has finally said, look, um, instead of trying to finally come up with the definition of religion uh, or secular for that matter, which is the kind of opposite, um, let's look at uh, the genealogy of this distinction. Where, where did this distinction come from? And you find that it's a modern Western distinction uh, between religious and secular. It's fairly recent, kind of arises in the, the 16th century. Um, and it's not by any means kind of part of the nature of things. You know, you look at Islam and uh, you say, um, you know, where's the distinction between religious and secular there? Uh, the great scholar of Islam, John Esposito, says to call Islam a religion is already to label it an abnormal religion because they don't separate religion and politics in the way that that we in the west do so there's this whole kind of ideological use of the religious secular distinction which oftentimes just ends up being religious are the kind of things that we consider to be irrational and want to be marginalized from public power and what we call secular are the things that we like right um and so um and you can see this you know Time and time again, Richard, Christopher Hitchens's book, uh, God is Not Great, you know, which is this, the subtitle is uh, with typical British understatement, how religion poisons everything. Right? Um, so he looks at this question at, at some, so it's all an indictment about religion. And at some point he looks at the question of um, atheist violence, you know, Stalin and, you know, Kim Jong-un and, you know, the rest of it. Paul Pot, and uh, you know, I mean, because because if you if you tot up the numbers, um, and you ask who in the last hundred years has killed more people, Muslims or atheists, the answer is atheists, and it's not even close, right? Um, and so he solves this problem. Hitchens does by just moving Stalin and Paul Pot and the rest of them over into the religious category. He says, ah, no, but they're actually religious um, because they, you know all of these things that people have noticed, they have this kind of transcendent uh, worldview and, you know, liturgy and sacrament and ritual and, and the whole bunch of it. Um, so basically the religious secular distinction becomes the distinction between things Hitchens likes and the things Hitchens doesn't like, you know. Um, and so it, it's, it's basically this kind of arbitrary uh, distinction. And so what I'm trying to do is um, pull out the, the implications of this, that perhaps we don't actually live in a secular world. Um, we just live in a world where 
the holy has migrated to uh, other things, um, or as as the Bible uh, might call it, idolatry, right? Um, the Bible recognizes, I mean, this is really nothing new. Um, th this is my next book that I'm almost done with now on idolatry, and it's basically just a, just a fundamental biblical in insight that people worship all sorts of things, um, and um, uh, some of them are uh, more good and some are, are less good, right? Uh, yeah. and, and that's the whole trick, is try, like trying to, to decide what is of, of God and what's not. Absolutely, that is, that is the trick. Um, I, I, pleased that you mentioned uh, Eugene McCarraher's work on uh, mammonism. Um, uh, I, I find that uh, critics of capitalism, uh, especially on the right, I would say, that, that they want to have uh, a language uh, with which they can criticize uh, capitalism. Um, you know, if they're the kind of person on the right who is not particularly libertarian, uh, not interested in laissez-faire, um, but they don't want to be using the same language of the left. They want something that's more distinctly theirs. And part of the problem, and you know, I've tried to point this out, but I'm, I'm not unique in doing so. Part of the problem is that, well, if we consider uh, that part of the the right to, you know, be acting on uh, a more Christian foundation of uh, Western Western civilization, then we do have a language with which to criticize um, capitalism. And, and as you say, you know, it goes right back to the Bible. There's there's nothing new about this, and we can say it's it's mammonism. There's been a departure from uh, Christianity. Um, and well, where, where do you go from there? Um, wh what I perceive to be the main problem with modernity, uh, Western secular modernity, um, this, this this problem of of mammonism, is there's a fundamentally gnostic uh, nature to it, and I, I'm interested to know whether you would uh, agree with me on that. And uh, wh what I mean by that is that uh, there's this uh, implicit trust in technology. Technology is, is kind of the, the, the liberator. It's going to liberate us from the constraints of our, our nature and uh, indeed of the, the natural world itself. And we're going to somehow over time in a very deterministic fashion just um, arrive at this point where we, uh, you know, technology has liberated us perhaps even from our own bodies um and i i see i see uh the the mammonism of it the the this this idolatry i see is all very much bound up together there's a very false um deliberately not christian view of man of society um our our purpose of uh a free will you know free will is very often denied. I'd say most people are very deterministic. Um, at least they would profess to be if they, you know, told you their view of of, of man and whether we have a free will or not. Um, and I, I I see money. I see uh, the, the the idolatry of you know consumerism. This uh, this spirit that has so overtaken the West as being pretty much bound up with all of that. I think from having read Being Consumed, you would largely agree with me there, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think we misunderstand the present moment if we think of it as a kind of materialism, that in a lot of ways it's the opposite of that. And I think that's the connection that you're making with uh, Gnosticism there. It's a kind of attempt to transcend uh, the material um, through the, uh, the the use of, of material things. And this is not you know, entirely new. I think, you know, anthropologists have pointed out, like Mary Douglas, for example, that, you know, we communicate with one another through material things. And, and that's part and parcel of a kind of sacramental view of the world. Um, but what's new is this kind of attempt to uh, deny death, deny materiality and find uh, transcendence 
in um, in, in things that are are not God. And so there's a way in which um, uh, it's very very much like what Augustine says that our hearts are restless until they rest in God. Um, there is this kind of natural restlessness with the material world and the finite nature of time, the fact that we're all going to die, you know, um, there, there's a, a longing to uh, transcend that. For Augustine, that ends in God. Um, for the kind of modern consumerism or this kind of technological um, paradigm as well, it just means that you kind of move on to the next the next thing, you know. So consumerism is um, it is uh, about detachment from products. It's not about attachments to things. You always have to be looking for the next iPhone, you know, the the next version of of your smartphone, whatever it is. Um, the organized creation of dissatisfaction, as a, a an internal memo from General Motors put it when they were talking about changing car models every year, you know. You have to constantly be looking. Our desires are restless, but they never come to rest in God. They just constantly kind of move on to the next thing. So I think they're. I think that's absolutely right. It's not a kind of clinging and materialism. There's an aspiration to transcendence there. That's that's real, you know. And I and I think one of the things that I'm trying to do in this book on idolatry is point out how. Idolatry has a moment of sympathy, like idolatry critique has or should have a moment of deep sympathy in it because it's a recognition that all of us are searching and we're all searching uh, for God and in, in many different ways, often in all the wrong places as the country song goes, um, but, we're, but, but there is this kind of search uh, for God. So if you look at Acts uh, 17, where Paul is talking to the Athenians, you know, he, he on the one hand is appalled by their idolatry, but on the other hand says, recognizes that you're very, you know, extremely, extremely religious as one translation, deici daimonesterus, you know, um, uh, th that you're looking for something and maybe you can, mm -hmm. you know, continue to grope and find God because God is present. Uh, in the creation. And so I think there needs to be, a, you know, the, it, it can't just be the, these kind of Jeremiads from Christians saying, oh, the modern world has gone to hell and, and um, we're the only ones with the right answer. You know, um, it, it is, I think, this, this kind of deeply Augustinian and biblical sympathy with the way that people are searching uh, for God in the material world. And we need to present um, you know, a, a truly sacramental uh, view of the the world that um, that can be healed by God. Yes, and it's um, the you mentioned it before, didn't you? Uh, there's there's a longing for for belonging as as well. There's this need for identity, and 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 again. Um, the, the the consumeristic lifestyle that that we live now, uh, we, we we just don't get we don't get a true an authentic I should say um, identity really with uh, values and you know our our identity is kind of manufactured for us we you know, try our own hair color and you know, putting on different items of clothing which are not really unique to us, um, uh, but it, 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 we get some kind of belonging with certain brands, you know, and just that word brand alone um, mm. <laughs> it really gives us this sense, even if just subconsciously, of what we're becoming by just, you know, succumbing to, to that culture. And, uh, and in terms of our values, again, very, inorganic uh, you, you know, we will we'll work for a very large company and they will have their own values you know their corporate values and again this is something very plastic plastic is a word i tend to use a lot when i'm describing these things because immediately people know exactly what i mean um th th this is it, it's it's not born out of um um familial 
relations. It's, it's not born out of um, uh, natural, loving community or anything like that. This, it's, it's very manufactured for us. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciated so much in your book what you said about, you know, and you, you've just, you said it just there, with materialism, it's not that we are, you know, belonging to these material things. It's that the material things that are produced for us are becoming increasingly disposable. And we, we, it, you know, it feels and it, it seems, are also becoming increasingly dehumanized and disposable as well. Mm -hmm. um, I now I, a question I wanted to ask you was um, I uh, with your book being consumed my, my my takeaway from it and what I tried to describe it as you know I'm talking about it to other people I say well in our consumeristic Western society now we are just being consumed you know we have become very plastic we have become very inauthentic and the the system if you will um sees us in very disposable terms um you know we're numbers numbers on the sheet um and um we we we're kind of consumed by this this machine um and again, you see, that's the word that pops to mind. You know, I think of our society now as being a machine. It's something very soulless. It's very inhuman. It's very, um, there's a pitiless indifference towards us. And um, I, I loved how you contrasted that, of course, um, with, uh, you know, the, the world that the modern West has emerged from, which was Christendom, where, Yes. Okay. We we were we were being consumed. You know, when we when we um, um, receive the Eucharist, we we are supposed to be consuming Christ. And but on the other hand, we're also being consumed by Christ. He's dwelling in us. We're dwelling in Him. There's a unity there. But you see, it's all very personal. It's deeply, deeply personal. Um, Yes, it's corporate, okay, but not in a modern sense where you're working for a big corporation which feels like a machine. No, it's, 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 it's something deeply human in, in ways which can be quite difficult to describe apart from through these mysteries of us being united with Christ and united as one together. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that's the kind of distinction I was left with from your book. With modernity, yeah. it's a machine nature to it when we're being consumed by it. Right. I mean, part of the question to ask, of course, is like, what are the ends of the different kinds of corporations? Uh, the end of the modern corporation is uh, the making of, of profit for the shareholders. And, um, and the end of the body of Christ as a different kind of body, a different kind of corporate uh, reality is, is quite different. The end is communion uh, with God in and through other people. And so when one suffers, all suffer together. And when one rejoices, all rejoice together. Um, and that's very different from the kind of telos of the, uh, of the modern corporation. Yes. Yeah, I appreciated it so much, especially there, there was a, a story that you told that sort of concluded the book. And it, it may seem a bit cliche, it may seem a bit saccharine sweet, but actually I, I loved it because it summed up uh, my feelings entirely. C coming from um, quite a libertarian uh, background, but always having an uneasiness about uh, the ability to accumulate um, economic power and therefore coercive power over people in the sort of laissez-faire capitalism side of things. Um, you, you told this story of a lady who gave you a gift. Now you're gonna to have to forgive my memory. Look, all these colored, colored tabs and I can't remember. I should, have, I should have read it again before we started, but there's this a story of a lady who gave you a gift and you just you just knew it would have been completely inappropriate. It would have been completely beside the point to have given her anything uh, to reciprocate, you know, as a part of some uh, transaction. 
the transaction that was taking place was not something material. And I mean, the, the, the more I study, the more I think about it, the more I think that our, you know, the, the, the Christian view of man is correct. It's not our fundamental nature to, um, you know, be at war with each other over material things, over scarce goods. Um, and I think the anthropological data uh, backs up uh, John Milbank's view that, uh, you know, way, way back, uh, the first interactions we had were, were gifting, to gift to each other and no forethought about it, not thinking about what you're going to get back later, not consciously anyway. And of course, primordially speaking, um, neither you nor I but would be here speaking to each other if we didn't have the unconditional love of our mother um, and, you know, having been raised by some guardian of some sort, you know, unconditionally, of course. Um, and I, I just thought that was an excellent way of concluding the book with this 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 gift there. Um, yeah, maybe I should tell the story. Um, so it's uh, I was living and working in a poor neighborhood of Santiago, Chile, in the late 1980s, uh, under the last years of the Pinochet regime, and I had gotten to know uh, a woman um, named Rosalinda who um, was very poor. And um, she basically provided for her and her mother by crocheting uh, little um, potholders, basically, uh, for taking the tea. People in Chile drink tea more than people in England uh, do. I think they picked the, picked the habit up from the British back in the 19th century. Um, but she gave me one of these. Um, and I, my first impulse was to give her some money for it. And then I realized that this, of course, would kind of uh, be the wrong thing to do uh, because it would kind of establish this as a transaction rather than something that united us and so it would re-establish the boundary between her and me and between my stuff and her stuff to, to make it into a trans transaction so what it did is kind of open up a much more kind of dangerous and uncertain territory in which the boundary between me and her and my stuff and her stuff was blurred. Um, and that's, I think, kind of part of what we're called to uh, in the Christian life. Um, the story ends there, unfortunately, um, uh, and it still haunts me precisely because I'm not sure I ever did, it, it, because it, it, it leaves us in our respective places of rich and poor. Right, and so what needs to happen is much more uh, than that. There needs to be some actual, um, you know, a different kind of economy uh, that that's created, or different kinds of economy, better yet, um, that overcome these uh, uh, distinctions between rich and poor. Um, but that's the that's the beauty of the gift, and that's what happens in the Eucharist. I'm arguing as well is that it breaks down these boundaries in ways that ought to unsettle us and ought to create different kinds of uh, ways of living in the world and not just be a kind of aesthetic, you know, uh, appreciation, right? Yes, yes. Um, I mean, in, in that sense, um, your thoughts there, I, I, I find your writing very useful because it's, it's, it's asking questions from a very Christian place. You're not um, launching some kind of very intellectual assault on economic points, uh, you know, to try and uh, attack people of the Austrian school of economics or any, and not, you're, not, you're not doing that. That's not the purpose of the book. Um, and yet the many Christians I know who you know, are libertarians and they are very laissez-faire in their economic views, it's, it's difficult to answer. It's, it's difficult to answer something like that. It, 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 it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, if they were confronted with this, this lady and that gift, they, of course, have to, from that point, confront the whole edifice, the, the, the whole thing, the whole system there. Um, I wanted to ask you, would you would you say that you are somewhat you're 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 Catholic, obviously, mm -hmm. um, as am I? Um, 
in in that sense, I, I found your writing to be different from, say, someone like uh, G.K. Chesterton. Um, you're, you're you're not launching, you know, an, a, a massive critique of capitalism per se. And yet, with that comment there, you said, well, you know, in in some ideal, not ideal. What can I say? In 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 a more Christian society, let's say. Um, economics would look very different. It would be very different. W would you describe yourself then as being somewhat of a distributist along more Chestertonian lines, or uh, do you have perhaps a more nuanced view of things? Yeah, I suppose um, I, I would, I, I guess I would uh, call myself a distributist um, in the sense that uh, the kind of wide distribution of power and wealth is probably the best we're going to be able to do here on earth. Uh, and so, you know, you read Chesterton, uh, Outline Sanity, and that's, I, I think, a really profoundly uh, interesting volume. I mean, he's trying to um, get the sort of redistribution of wealth and power uh, in a way that doesn't run through a kind of Marxist revolution where um, you have this kind of violent overthrow uh, and seizing of the means of production by the proletariat and so on. And that, uh, to me as well, seems like a dead end. But then the question is, what, um, what do you do from that? And I think it, it really does take a kind of re, uh, retooling of uh, economies from, uh, from the ground up. Um, Ivan Illich is another uh, Catholic figure that I think is very interesting on this. I mean, he points out all of the different ways in which um, a kind of decent subsistence has been replaced by a kind of modernized poverty in which even the ability of people to make a life for themselves uh, has been taken away from them and given to experts. And, um, you know, the, our education is delegated. Wendell Berry talks about this as well. Our education is delegated to others. Our economy is delegated to others. Our political decision making is delegated to others, and people find themselves more and more um, kind of uh, helpless. So, in that sense, you know, uh, when Illich talks about uh, vernacular culture, uh, and uh, Chesterton talks about distributism, uh, I think th that's kind of the um, the Catholic thought world that I'm. Uh, coming from uh, as well. There was, you know, in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, um, a kind of romanticism about the Middle Ages as, um, you know, coming from Gierke and Maitland and so on, um, as being a place where power is more uh, distributed and you had all of these kind of overlapping jurisdictions and so on. Um, and I don't want to go that route of, of you know, romanticizing the Middle Ages because obviously there are, you know, it, it was still a very rigidly hierarchical uh, society and anti-Semitic and, and so on. Um, but the idea that then gets picked up and turned into this uh, idea of subsidiarity, I think is a, um, is a, a, a true uh, impulse and one that kind of comes from uh, a sort of Augustinian idea that um, he who governs governs best governs uh, least in some ways. You know, you, you have. I mean, in some ways, there's two uh, kind of Catholic views of power. Um, one is um, a kind of Augustinian view that. Uh, coercive power comes about because of the fall. And the other is a kind of Thomist view that um, there's something natural about governance, that it's not just a result of the fall. And if that, I, I think identifying them with Augustine and Thomas is, is oversimplified. But nevertheless, um, uh, in that dichotomy, I would uh, decidedly come down on the, uh, what I would think of as the Augustinian side, right? That, um, that the, uh, the ideal is that we um, we govern ourselves, and it's because of sin that we are governed uh, 
by and that, that we need to, to govern each other. And that might be necessary, but, um, but the ideal is the kind of um, uh, what Dorothy Day uh, and John Paul II would call personalism, right? Um, another kind of strand of Catholic thought in the 20th century. The idea is that um, you attend to the other as uh, a, a human being, as a person beloved by God and unique, uh, uniquely made in God's image. Uh, and you think in terms of persons before you think in terms of large uh, structures and so on. Um, uh, Ivan Illich has this wonderful uh, reading of the Good Samaritan parable where he says that we usually take this parable to mean that care for one another has been uh, universalized so that we don't just care for our own, but we care for those outside of our group. So the Samaritan cares for the Jew. And then we take this kind of universalization and we blow it up into a kind of institutionalization and you know, the way Paul Ramsey does well, if it's, um, you know, if it's good for the Samaritan to take care of the beaten up Jew, then what we really need is a police force on the Jericho Road to keep people from being beaten up in the first place. And it, and it kind of grows into this kind of institutional, you know, bureaucracy. And Ivan Illich says that the, that the real message of the Good Samaritan is not that our neighbor is, uh, everybody, but that our neighbor is anybody that God throws in our path. Um, and so it's this kind of reaching out to another person that contingency or providence has brought us into relationship with. And, and you know, as, as it says in, in the Gospel of Luke, he, he was moved in his in his bowels uh, is the Greek. Um, you know, he was moved. It was a gut feeling. It was a uh, an incarnated reaching out to another uh, human being. Uh, and that's what, you know, Illich thinks Christianity is. So the, 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 the regarding one another as people to be cared for at the lowest level, at the most basic personal level uh, as possible is kind of uh, what we're after. And that's precisely what our economy uh, in so many ways uh, leads us to um, uh, leads us away from, right? So now, uh, you see this especially in, in the pandemic, uh, you don't have to deal with a human being at all uh, in order to purchase products. You just look at things on the screen, you click up on them, and they magically materialize on your doorstep a couple of days later. And all of the people that are, you know, the, the Thai women, you know, working for 40 cents an hour, uh, you know, at age 14, all of the people in the Amazon warehouses who are barely making ends meet while Jeff Bezos makes, um, you know, in, in 2020, he made an average of $183 million a day. Um, and all of that is just invisible uh, to us. And so that's the, the kind of epitome of a depersonalized economy. And, um, and so part of our task is to just repersonalize the economy, to see people, to see the people that are, you know, working in sweatshops, to see the people that are working in warehouses. Um, but we've been dazzled, you know, this is what Marx is talking about when he talks about um, the fetishism of commodities. You know, all we see is the commodity and the people all disappear. So the commodity takes on life. The Amazon packages with the big smile on them and the commercials where the packages are singing and dancing. The packages take on life. The commodities take on life while life is being drained away um, from the actual human beings. The, which, by the way, is um, oftentimes the way the Bible talks about idolatry. We, we invest material things with life um, while the life is kind of sucked away from uh, from the people who, you know, reverence these things. Long yeah. answer to that question. But. Oh, but a good answer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I um, yeah, I forgot about that aspect of your writing. Actually, yes, the the, the talking about the the, the commodity um, as as an idol. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Then losing sight 
of um, of the worker, uh, of each other even. Um, yeah, all, all, all good critiques. Um, if if I were if I were to challenge you at all, it would be along similar lines that I am probably best known for challenging libertarians. Uh, so, with, with libertarianism, my my main critique with them, uh, uh, particularly the more uh, anarchistic of the libertarians, um, who would you know they'd, they'd agree with me and you in terms of uh, things that we're saying about particularly about subsidiarity where we're saying oh okay okay institutions of some kinds will be necessary at a point to handle problems that are too big they're too big for the the, the polis or the the village um to, to to handle but but they are problems nevertheless they're issues that do need to be handled especially with the technology that we have now and uh, uh, especially the levels of travel that we're able of, of uh, we're capable of doing um, but I would say in a society where it's, it's more anarchistic and perhaps in you know their idealized society there's no government per se there are even just insurance companies that handle everything you know you know the kind of thing i'm talking oh, yeah. about yeah. yeah um you're this is completely ignoring the fact that there are markets for injustice and i take it further than that and i say this is this is just assuming um, a, a, a Christian foundation of values across the West, where we are all in agreement about what justice is in the first place. Um, you, you cannot just assume a shared definition of justice across a polity, a series of villages, communities, groupings of any kind. Um, uh, and this has actually led to uh, some notable thinkers who were of that school of libertarianism uh, coming around to sharing some of my ideas and saying things like you were saying before, romanticizing the medieval period and saying, oh, okay, perhaps that's the best that we can hope for then. Uh, these you know, decentralized polities of the medieval period, all very small, but you have some kind of subsidiarist hierarchy. So, you know, the Christian principle is there. Um, you know, uh, uh, duties, uh, uh, rights, um, the handling of everyday problems and things. It has to be as local to the person, not necessarily the individual, but the person as possible and the, the family and the, the community. And, and then we can think about appealing or, you know, having slightly more centralized orders thereafter. Um, but again, this it, it, it's it's just assuming that we're going to have a shared definition of Christianity. I, I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are um, regarding certain thinkers like, uh, like like John Milbank or Catherine Pickstock, uh, who are the, the the radical orthodoxy thinkers of, of uh, Cambridge, who would say um, so. They'd agree with me on that point. But they'd say, but you need to have some kind of territory where the religion has um, a space to exist it has it has a space in which it can be influential to um, the culture and the community and it can be there with its stories influencing people's ideas about what justice is and providing that shared definition of of justice um, go on I can see you want to jump, jump in immediately so, um, first to make the distinction between what I'm talking about and libertarianism, right? Um, so the difference is that the libertarian thinks that the individual is the basic unit of, um, well, basic unit of humanity. I was going to say of society, but society is a kind of abstraction. Um, and and it, the, you ought to just let people uh, govern one another, or go, govern themselves uh, and do what they want to do, right? Um, and what I'm talking about is uh, uh, local forms of community uh, and not just individuals, 
right? So that's that's one uh, one distinction that the the, um, the ideal is not the Western cowboy who rides off into the sunset by uh, him or herself, right? But the um, the ideal is one in which we are all members of the same body, and when one suffers, all suffer together, and when one rejoices. Uh, all rejoice together. It's a very unlibertarian uh, idea. Um, the other difference yes. is that um, I don't think that less government is uh, simply a means to an end, um, but rather is an end, right? So you don't um, create this society, you don't create um, self-reliant healthy local communities just by cutting uh, government aid and throwing people out on the mercy of you know the market or or whatever uh, else is there right an augustinian view is not that um you shouldn't have any government an augustinian view is that you don't have any government where there's no sin right and so where there is sin then clearly you do need uh, government and there is a role um, for uh, uh, state intervention under certain circumstances. And so it's not this libertarian idea that, well, you just do away with government and then everything's gonna be okay. Because um, clearly it, it, it won't, um, right? Um, but it is an idea that um, you that the goal is, so this is what I mean by the end. So it's, a, it's an end, not a means, that the, the goal is, um, the less coercion, the better, right? The goal is that people are living decent lives where they are um, uh, have some measure of um, say in in their own lives, and they're able to build uh, decent lives for themselves at the local level without having to uh, rely on or be oppressed by, which is more often the case. Uh, powers that are completely out of their control and and distant uh, from them. Yeah. So yeah, it's. Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. So. Oh, that's okay. Did you want to finish the point? Um. So then the other part of that question, then you you're asking me about Millbank uh, and yeah. and stock. Yeah. Um. I don't think I'm in the same place that uh, John Millbank is uh, on these questions. He's really. You know, we've had these conversations uh, before. He's he's a, a, a wonderful guy, a brilliant uh, thinker. Um, but we are not in the same place. I mean, he proposed a few years ago, kind of sending poor kids to military schools in Britain, and he really does think that you know um, that uh, the British military kind of is a repository of virtue. Uh, in the way that um, you know the American military is not, and so on. Um, and he has put forth an apology for um, for imperialism. <laughs> you know, and oh has, really, you know, I had uh, no idea it, about this. Right. I mean, uh, you know, in in a you know a, a, a different way, obviously. But um, uh, but yeah, I mean. I mean um, but he really does think, you know, I mean, he he said to me one time that he really thinks of the ideal as the kind of, you know, early medieval um, king, I suppose, uh, where you have, uh, you know, kind of Christian kings that um, uh, are creating uh, spaces for the church to flourish and so on. Um, if that ever was a good idea, um, it doesn't sound to me like it's very feasible or, or a, a good idea now. Um, I, I can't speak for um, for Milbank. I mean, his ideas are obviously a lot more nuanced than what I'm uh, giving them credit for. But of I, um, uh, um, I mean, one way of putting it is that I mean, he's a very kind of unapologetic um, Church of England. Uh, yes. A person who thinks that um, that the church and the civil authorities ought to be bound up uh, together in yes. some way, uh, and I don't. Um, you know, in in some ways, I'm a Catholic uh, who thinks that the best thing that ever happened to us was the kind of uh, church that goes beyond the borders of the nation state and is truly. Catholic with a small C and universal, and what that means is 
uh, being separated from coercive power. Um, and I think, you know, the church did not give that up. And there's still elements of the Catholic Church that want to cling to uh, coercive power in one way or another. Um, but I really think that we need to be liberated from that. And that's one of the <clears throat> one of the gifts of modernity is the um, involuntary uh, liberation of the church from the wielding of coercive power. Um, and that that's something I find very fascinating about you, Bill. And actually, uh, that's probably what I've been most looking forward to talking to you about. Because, okay, a bit of background. So, with my writing, I've been described as um, uh, medieval libertarian, a reactionary. That kind of, everything you were just saying about uh, about John Milbank and romanticizing the early medieval period and the the king and the knights and all this kind of stuff and and the, de the decentralized political order all of this sort of thing it, it, it resonates with me very strongly but look i'm i also happen to agree with you you know to say well it's not feasible to expect that kind of thing to arise again unless there's some kind of bizarre unprecedented civilizational collapse and I don't even know how that would work now with the level of technology we have. Um, so, you know, I, I recognize these are romantic thoughts that I have that are um, informing what, what kinds of things I would like to see politically. Now, what I find so fascinating is um, everything you were saying before about, uh, you know, there being Christian communities and um, in these communities, um, there perhaps be some kind of political process, you know, something something paternalistic, which is encouraging better habits in people. So, but genuinely, they they do will the sort of um, Christian good within their communities that you were speaking of before. Music to my ears, um, but not, um, not I say paternalistic. But I <laughs> I want to oh no no no! It was just that that term, but uh, that, anyway, yeah. that's I, I'm I, I'm I'm kind of putting words in your mouth there because uh -huh. um, I I can't see how it I can't see how it would come about without the paternalistic political element, and so this is why you know full disclosure, um, you know I find um, and this this might be because my my grandmother was actually a fascist and she loved Mussolini okay uh, everybody loved her and I'd say oh you know because I'm part Italian I say you know she's a fascist right <laughs> don't be ridiculous you know because everybody loved her um but she was just very serious about Mussolini and um you know so I will look at corporatist experiments um across Europe in the 20th century um very reactionary um uh, using political coercive power, centralized coercive power, um, obviously, uh, to try and encourage um, good habits and even, you know, Catholicism and 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 Catholic habits in people to try and, um, well, I suppose you know one could argue that in the same way a father tries to. Um, teach their child in the right way but you know grace could be imparted uh, through that Th these are my feelings and this a is where father I'm and a mother, shall we say right a, a father and a mother um so it could be maternalistic is is maybe something that sounds a little bit less scary than paternalistic but anyway I, but I, <laughs> yes um and so uh, and you know in in those experiments throughout the 20th century, you know, there was um, there was an, a level of influence that was given to the church within the political order um, in terms of where workers' unions had to be, you know, were, were um, representatives, not just represented, but they had heads of their particular area of industry rep representing them in the government. Um, but you know to actually be a legitimate legitimated uh, workers union in the country uh, they had to you know give a certain amount of money to um, um, you know explicitly catholic charitable charitable groups and they had to um, 
make sure people go to church. You know, they did all sorts of things like that. Are, now, are we talking about Mussolini's Italy here? or, or what, Well, I mean, what, the stuff like that did happen in, in Italy, perhaps not to the extent that uh, it might have done um, in some other parts of Europe, you know, perhaps. So what, with, what, uh, what historical place and time are we talking about here? Richard. I'm giving a very, very broad series of policies and things from um, fascist Italy, um, Franco Spain, um, Salazar, let's say, and also just ideas that people were bandying about at that time mm -hmm. anyway. Um, I mean, my, my, my question is basically, um, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that um, the, the kind of community that you have in mind and that you idealize, it sounds exactly like what I have in mind, but I, I have no idea how one would even get there. I don't know if there is a solution. Um, the, the only thing I've been able to sort of arrive at, which is more feasible than you know, early medieval kings and you know, the rise of kings again, which I just don't see ever happening, is things that people were trying out in 20th century Europe. I don't even know if that's necessarily um, right or good. You know, as you say, the, the trick is trying to figure out what is um, what, what is okay by God or not. Um, yeah. And so I'm fascinated uh, that you, you're, you're very much against um, integralism um you know fascism sort of uh, muscular catholicism some people call it this political heavy-handedness trying to um um uh, encourage catholic habits and and yet um there's the desire to see um uh, communities which are um uh, much more you know willingly uh, catholic yeah, um, I think, the, you know, Franco, Mussolini, Salazar, that's where uh, Catholic social thought goes wrong in a very big and bad way, right? So you have um, these attempts in the 19th century. I've just actually uh, done a, a chapter on John Neville Figgis and tried to trace some of this uh, stuff where he, he stands in relationship to some of this Catholic corporatism. Um, so you get in the 19th century, some of these attempts to create um, other structures of uh, society that stand between the individual and the state uh, or between the individual and the business corporation. And yes, it comes to corporatism, yeah. right? And and they're basically um, experiments in um, in subsidiarity in in some ways. It, it, it what comes to be called subsidiarity, um, mm. but it makes a hard right turn when it's co-opted by the state in Italy and Portugal and and Spain and so on. Yes, um, and and then it it falls into very bad odor. Uh, precisely because um, it, it it gets co-opted by fascism, um, and so that's clearly a dead end. Um, but somebody like what John Neville Figgis is talking about in uh, in England, I think, is a uh, th that's a really interesting. He's a really interesting figure, and in some ways, he goes beyond just subsidiarity, um, because part of the problem with subsidiarity is that somebody at the top always has to decide um, what, uh, you know, at what level things get done. And so it, it, it Quite. tends to get absorbed uh, by the state. So everybody's in favor of subsidiarity, uh, which is always a kind of dangerous and I, an indication that something has gone wrong. Um, but something what, like what um, Pope Benedict XVI is talking about in Caritas and Veritate, is mm. the creation of, he talks about a dispersed political authority and he talks about the kind of evangelization of the economy by all these kind of businesses that people just start. Um, there's no kind of centralized authority starting them, but people start businesses in which 
the distinction between justice and charity is broken down. Uh, and, you know, um, fair trade kind of things where you don't set prices based on uh, the laws of supply and demand um, or what the shareholders, you know, the, boosting the shareholder price, but you set prices and you develop products uh, on the base and you pay people on the basis of what is going to lead to the flourishing of all of the parties involved. And this becomes a way then of kind of breaking down these what he calls the market and state binary, um, the, these kind of creation of other spaces. That's the sort of thing mm -hmm. that I'm interested in. And I'm not necessarily, I just don't think that we're at the stage anymore where you kind of get, you know, purely Catholic versions of this happening. I think, you know, it, it can be very ecumenical and open to others. But if Christianity has a future, uh, in the West, and if you know the, this kind of market state binary that we're all feeling kind of trapped by is going to be challenged, then it seems to me like something like these kinds of um, experiments in in different kinds of economy and different kinds of politics, if you want to put it in those terms, um, that seems really necessary and urgent. And they're kind of breaking out all over the place. Um, but but they need to, the first thing that needs to happen i think is we need to get away from the idea that there is just one thing called the economy and um you can either you know accept it or shake your fist at it um but the real truth is that there are economies there are all kinds of different e economies and what we need to do is recognize that uh, try to get think ourselves out of the inevitability of the present state of things and and create these other kinds of experiments of you know different ways of giving people their lives back yes yes and i i, I like the examples that you gave in being consumed uh, very much um the name is escaping me slightly is it mondragon the the um right the, the business in in Spain, which of course is very successful, so um, multi-billion-dollar uh, corporation, but it's yeah. owned, owned by the workers. Yes, it, it started by a Basque uh, priest, uh, based right. on the principles of distributism and so on. Yeah, yes, and so it's providing spaces uh, within like you just said the market of course this is not just a single entity we have to stop thinking that way this is providing just alternative economies if you will mm -hmm. alternative businesses showing a better way within the market which one would hope would be much more attractive to you know the sort of woke um white liberal sort of middle class person who intuitively understands uh, what's wrong with various aspects of the market um, and is seeking something better and well, there we are we, we, we have the examples of much better spaces practices something and of course it's it's built on the kind of Christian view of man that you've been talking about so I, I found that really fascinating that was excellent um, okay Bill, I've taken up an hour of your time here. I, well, more than that. So thank you for your patience there. Um, I think that we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day there. But I would like you to let everybody know where, where can they find you? Where they, can they find um, your, your writings? Obviously, they could do a, a Google Scholar search and find your academic articles, which I think are, are great and very readable. And so I would recommend them to people. But otherwise, where can they find you? Um, I mean, if you want to contact me by email, my email address is on, um, you know, is out there. You can look up DePaul University and, and find me. Um, and, you know, my books are available. Please don't buy them on Amazon. Um, <laughs> <if you wanna. laughs> uh, I, I, I try not to buy anything from uh, Amazon. There's lots of other booksellers out there. Uh, your mm. local bookstore uh, is the best way uh, to do it um yes yeah and and a lot of articles and stuff are out there in the public uh, domain so uh a quick uh search can find yeah. 
and everybody, the, the colored tabs say it all. I highly recommend being consumed. It's just, it, it's it just has a two virtues and it's short and cheap. It's only a hundred it, pages long and it's, it's you know, it's, 10, 10 bucks or something like that. So yeah. it's very readable. Yeah. I find you to be a very capturing writer and a speaker as well. Of course, you can find uh, some talks by Bill on YouTube. Uh, migrations of the holy that's that's a that's a pretty good one it's all good stuff um bill thank you so much it's been fascinating i could probably talk to you for the rest of the day but uh for everyone who powered through to the very end thank you very much and uh go and read something by bills go to your local bookshop and order one of his books straight away bill, thank you so much been a delight. i appreciate it thank you so much